All right, so first I'd just like to like to welcome everybody um, on their uh, busy Friday mornings to uh, sit in and uh, and learn a little bit about some of the new um, technology, um, processing technology that Trimble is uh, is come out with. Um, that's particularly in the uh, in the new Trimble R10. Um, this is the first um, webinar in a series of, of what we call technology sessions that we uh, we have planned or in the works, and um, hopefully we can. Uh, Start providing you more of these uh, these free sessions to to add some value um, to to the products that you're using. Um, those of you who may or may not know me, uh, my name is Jay Haskamp. I work for Frontier Precision, obviously out of the uh, Saint Cloud, Minnesota office, and I handle our uh, technical support and our certified uh, Trimble training. So I just want to give you a little bit of an outline of what we are going to be um, discussing or talking about today. Um, I want to start talking about the major epics of RTK innovation um, on the Trimble side of things. Um, just some GNSS positioning concepts, RTK methods, um, in particularly with what we're looking at, single base and VRS. Then I want to talk about this new uh, HD GNSS, this precision-based surveying, um, the XFIL technology, which means we can get some precise um, positioning without a correction stream. Trimble SurePoint, which is now built into the R10's kind of um, technology adopted from the Trimble robots, as well as uh, future GNSS support, and then summarize a few things and, and then save some time for questions at the end. So a little bit of an introduction. Um, those of you who have been with Trimble a long time, you probably know that Trimble's kind of led the development of high-precision GNSS systems since the mid-1980s. Um, RTK was quickly established once technology with radio communications, correction streams, um, on-the-fly initializations, and faster processors were made readily available. Um, the initialization techniques that we have used or we, we currently use up until this new HG, HD GNSS processing has been um, made public, um, these techniques that were, that were used to this float fixed uh, solution has been an effective tool, but these concepts or the, the, the theory and practice behind how this works um, was developed in the 1990s. As well with, uh, with GPS, we all know uh, no corrections are going to give us no uh, precise positions. And then we'll talk you know, specifically about the Trimble R10 system and how it incorporates this new technology for not only improving the field operation, but um, also the new the new positioning technology and what this XFIL technology will do. So the aim for this, this uh, session that we're doing today is to basically introduce you all to some of the underlying features of the R10 system, um, provide some real basic um, theory and background on high precision positioning, highlight some of the differences between this new HD GNSS technology and some of the conventional techniques that we may be used to. Um, discuss precision-based surveying, which means we are now uh, able to survey without a float fixed type of a solution. Um, kind of present to you and explain to you the XFIL technique and what that is. And then just better understand how this new technology um, built into this new receiver can make you a little bit more productive in the field. So I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, we're going to go back to 1988 when the Trimble 4000 SD was introduced. Um, in the world of Trimble, this is when the high precision surveying um, began. Uh, it was literally some groundbreaking technology. Uh, it was a dual frequency uh, 5L1 and 5L2 channels. So uh, basically it meant you could track five satellites. It had one megabyte of internal storage and it only weighed 98 pounds, not including the battery. And the, um, the information had to be post-processed in the office. That compares to today, where we're at in 2012, or now 2013, I should say, uh, with the Trimble R10, which weighs 2.5 pounds, including the battery. In 1985, there were nine GPS satellites in orbit. And in 1988, Trimble introduced the 4000 SLD. It was the first dual-frequency backpackable uh, receiver from Trimble. 
and it got a little bit lighter at that point. It weighed only 44 pounds without the car battery. We move on to 1994 with the release of the 4000 SSE. It was Trimble's first RTK uh, receiver that had the capability of on-the-fly initialization. Um, 1995, you can see GPS was declared fully operational at that point, and the 4000 SSE weighed 15.4 pounds with everything. 1997. We saw Trimble's first RTK uh, receiver with no strings attached, as they called it. It was the uh, 4800. Um, the total weight of this receiver was 8.5 pounds. That was a full RTK rover with the data collector and everything. And uh, March of 2000 was kind of a big deal. Selective availability was switched off by the government. And in 2005, the first modernized GPS 2RM satellite was launched. Also in 2005, the Trimble R8 GNSS receiver was introduced. It was Trimble's first GPS and GLONASS RTK receiver. Uh, many of you probably are still using um, some form of this receiver today. The total weight of that receiver for a full RTK rover was 8.2 pounds. Then we get to uh, 2012. At that time, which is last year, there was 31 GPS and 24 GLONASS satellites in orbit, and we saw the introduction of the Trimble R10. The R10 total weight full RTK rover is 7.9 pounds. So you can see this has dramatically uh, decreased in weight and gotten a lot easier to use um, from the, than, than we saw with the first receiver back in the 80s. All right, so that's kind of the little history of uh, Trimble RTK or Trimble uh, G GPS technology. Um, now I want to just go through a little bit of uh, technical background and, and give you some um, positioning, GNSS positioning uh, principles and give you a little background on how this works. So our GNSS receivers measures the pseudo range or, or a fancy term for distance to each satellite that we have in view to determine a position. The location of each of these satellites is known from the control segment of GPS, some orbital, um, orbital parameters, and things like that. The position and time can be determined by the receiver by measuring these pseudo ranges um, and, and measuring the pseudo ranges from the known satellite location. So it's a, it's a process called trilateration or satellite ranging. But we also have some issues. We have some errors that affect our GNSS, uh, GNSS measurements. The first error we have is some satellite orbit and clock errors, which can directly affect the user satellite uh, measurements. We also have ionospheric errors, which cause frequency-dependent error in GNSS measurement. Um, the ionosphere is this layer of atmosphere full of uh, charged particles. Um, some of you have, may have experienced in the last uh, couple of weeks um, some issues with the increased solar activity. Uh, we actually sent out a post about it on our survey blog. Um, the ionosphere is directly affected by this increased solar activity. We also have the troposphere, which is kind of the, the layer of atmosphere that we work in, which can cause a delay in the GNSS signals. We have something called multipath, or on your, on your controller in the field, you might see it read out as RMS which is uh, caused by signal reflecting off a nearby object. So not only are we getting the satellite signal directly, we're also getting that same signal a fraction of a second later because it's bounced off maybe a nearby object. Then we also have signal masking, um, which reduces, tracks satellites, and degrades the range uh, measurement accuracy. Autonomous positioning for uh, mapping and GIS type applications. Autonomous positioning is normally estimated using GNSS code-based measurements and gives us a typical accuracy around one to five meters. So the satellite and atmospheric errors that, that we might be experiencing all directly impact the accuracy of the computed position 
when using signal uh, single frequency autonomous positioning. We also have something called differential positioning. So an example here is using a CMR or an RTCM type correction. So the satellite and atmospheric errors are nearly identical for the two receivers that are closely spaced uh, together. With the differential technique, the relative position of the rover is computed with respect to the single reference station. And the differential corrections are generated by the reference station and applied to the rover. And typically the differential, differential positioning accuracy, it's, it's definitely superior to the autonomous positioning. It's typically less than a meter. But now we're seeing uh, some, new, some new technology which is improving position, or precision I should say, using carrier phased uh, results versus code phased results. So you can see here we have our carrier phased, uh, our, re our uh, representation of carrier phased measurements and our code phased measurements. So these GNSS pseudo ranges or distances measurements are based on PRN code data. The code measurements have a precision of a few decimeters. But the carrier phase measurements have millimeter level precision. However, they contain what we call an integer bias. And once we can resolve that integer bias, or if you've been in our training classes, you might have heard the term integer ambiguity. Once we can resolve that on each satellite, the carrier phase measurements will then deliver our precise um, accuracy, our precise uh, position. So using multiple frequency uh, carrier phase wavelengths, we can reduce the effects of these ionospheric errors. So satellites, uh, modern satellites now are broadcasting on multiple frequency bands. So just some examples, we have L1, L2, uh, you may have heard of it, L2C, L5, uh, we have a GLONASS L1 and L2, Galileo E1, E5, E6. These are all carrier phase um, frequencies or wavelengths that are being broadcast out of modern satellites. Multi-frequency carrier phase and code observations can help us correct for these ionospheric errors and speed up the um, ambiguity resolution or estimation. So when we work in an RTK, a single base mode RTK scenario, the satellite and the atmospheric errors are nearly identical for closely spaced reference and rover stations. This is pretty critical. Um, this is where we say you, we want to keep our base and our rover um, relatively close together. With, we we kind of use a 6.2 mile number. That is because the system can then model the atmospheric delay and satellite orbit delay because our receivers are relatively in the same spot. And that's also written into the specification of RTK itself. It's based on that kind of that 6.2 mile uh, distance. So the single GNSS base or the reference station establishes or is established near the worksite and tracks all the satellites in view. And the reference station then delivers the corrections to the rover via the radio link. The rover then applies the correction supplied by the reference station to obtain our centimeter level results that we get with RTK. We also have this VRS or this virtual reference station that is uh, rapidly growing uh, throughout our region. The GNSS reference stations are established over wide geographic regions. So it could be a city, a state, um, country, things like that. And the reference station spacing is typically 50 to 100 kilometers. The reference stations act like a single base. They, they track all the satellites in view at their location. And then we have a pivot platform server that concentrates all that information, models the sat satellite and atmospheric errors over the entire network. That's what enables us to have longer baselines. So basically, if I'm going to use Minnesota for an example. We have a network that covers the state. The servers that run the VRS network are modeling satellite and atmospheric errors for the whole network. The network server generates a virtual reference station where the uh, rover survey is started and provides corrections via wireless internet connection. And then the rover obtains a centimeter level accuracy within coverage. All right, so let's break down a little bit now the float fix solution that many of us are, are used to. 
So carrier phase ambiguities are by definition an integer quantity. We need to make use of the integer nature of the carrier phase ambiguities to gain the most accuracy from our GNSS. So traditional ambiguity resolution, the approach to this involves first estimating the carrier phase ambiguities as a floating point or real value numbers. That's where we get the term float solution. So what we're saying here is when we lock on to the, this, the carrier phase signal from our satellite, we're locking onto an integer. These are all integers, these wavelengths right here. And the system has to determine which one of these integers we are locked onto or which one is the correct one that we are tracking so we can determine our solution. And before we, when we're locked on and before we have that figured out, that's where, when we're in float mode. We're somewhere in the ballpark. The code measurements are also used to refine that estimate to try to help the, the receiver figure out which one of these integers that it is, it is, is um, locked onto or it's tracking. So we'll break it down kind of in a two-dimensional view as well. So we're just going to look at a, a small number of satellites. So we have satellite one. When we lock onto satellite one, we're in float mode. So we're somewhere in this shaded red area. This is somewhere in, 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 in the ballpark. But we're also looking at the wavelengths or the wave fronts from satellite one. So we know that these three wavelengths cross within our float area. So we know we're somewhere on one of these three integers. We have the direction of satellite two. We have our same float solution. We're somewhere within that shaded area. And we also have our wave fronts from satellite two. So we know that within this shaded area right here, we are on one of these locations where these two wave fronts are intersecting. Add satellite three. Again, the float solution from satellite three, our wavelengths from satellite three. And now we have a definable float area or a float search area. So everywhere where these three wavelengths, obviously this is going to be on a larger scale in a real world scenario. We may be talking 12 to 20 satellites. But in this example, our integer candidate locations or our possible fixed solutions are where these wave fronts best intersect each other. The correct integer candidate is obviously in the center of this float solution where everything best intersects. So basically what we have here with the float flick, oops, a float fixed solution is it's going to look at, it's basically going to make its best guess to our location and see if that best guess holds together over a period of time before it can determine that it is the correct position and, and fix. So the integer search picks one set of integer ambiguities and ignores all the information available in the search space. So what I'm telling you here is once the system chooses this location, it ignores everything else. It ignores all other possible candidate locations and focuses on this one solution it came up with to determine that if it is indeed the correct, uh, the correct position. Repeated searching it's, is effective, but it's not a, a, uh, a full-blown solution. And there's a large disparity between precision of the float solution and the fixed solution. So we could be talking maybe three feet, four feet in the float solution down to sub-centimeter in the fixed solution. There's a large, a large jump there. So as you can see, down on the graph here, we have our positional error in meters, and we have our time. So our float solution starts out with a lot of air and it slowly gets better and better and better over time until the software makes that best guess and says okay this is the spot and then it's going to jump us down to a fixed solution. So we have a very large jump right here. However, there is a chance we could get an incorrect fix or a bad initialization which we could show here which will lead to position outliers with low reported position. So what that means is we may be um, incorrectly fixed, but our precision values on the bottom of the screen are going to be reported as low values, giving us almost a false, um, a false initialization.
So it's going to look good, but it's actually not going to be right. So that's kind of the float fixed method of doing things. Now I want to kind of introduce you to this HD GNSS concept and the new way that, that this stuff is being computed. So HD GNSS um, is a state-of-the-art technique for processing carrier phase data, which includes generalized method for dealing with biases on the carrier phase data, using all of the information within the search space to provide a statistically optimum resolution, improved a priori measurement noise models, rigorous gener generation of the a posteriori precision, precisions, a little bit of a mouthful there. And techniques have now been made possible with the advent of high-performance microprocessors. So think of um, these high-performance microprocessors being similar to what we have in cell phones and mobile computers today. So the advancement of that technology has really kind of spurred this, this uh, processing technology within the R10. So some HD GNSS basics, um, kind of in a one-dimensional view here. So we have an, uh, looking at the ambiguity resolution. So we have this probability distribution of the estimated float solution. So again, this would be similar to the previous slide where we had the shaded area as our uh, float solution. The peak of this wavelength here is our float ambiguity, our best estimate of that ambiguity resolution. Now we're passing our wave fronts or our, our um, integer candidates through this float area. And the most probable integer, the most probable answer, is the wavelength that's closest to the float estimate. However, all the integer candidates that fall within the bounds of this float solution are considered in the initial HD GNSS solution as a probable, uh, as a probable candidate. So if we take that same example and we look at it as being a biased float solution, meaning that there's some error introduced in there, whether it's through the ionospheric um, error or something like that, we have a, let's just say we, it's shifted. So we have this, again, a biased float solution, and we have our biased best ambiguity or best answer estimation at the peak of this solution. So now you can see we have a bias in our float solution. And the best integer solution or the best answer based on the traditional approach of float fixed would be this value right here because it's the closest to the, the, the ambiguity estimate in the float solution. But the correct ambiguity candidate is actually over here and has a low probability based on the solution. The float fixed solution would discard that, but we cannot do that. The HD GNSS, the new uh, precision-based solution, will actually still take that into account. So as we have our float ambiguity estimate, we also measure and calculate the bias and probability of each candidate in the solution. So every single one of these possible candidates is calculated as a probable answer in the solution. And again, you might have heard this, uh, this term in the past, but it requires an overdetermined solution to be able to assess the quality, meaning we need to, uh, to still track at least five satellites in order to, uh, to initialize. And now if we look at this in 2D, maybe this will, this will clear things up a little bit. We have our wave fronts from our three satellites like we did in the previous example. All of these circled areas are integer candidates. And with an overdetermined number of satellites, five or more, the quality of each one of these candidates can be calculated and assessed. The precisions are reported by the HD GNSS solution and encapsulates to encapsulate the distribution of an integer candidate. So basically, based on the calculations, it can say we are somewhere within this area and it can look at which um, integer candidate falls within that, um, that HD GNSS solution. So the difference is where we have a float solution and we do a best, let's say, an, um, our best guess to find out which one is right. We're going to say that's the one. We're going to hold that and see if it holds together. The HD GNSS processing 
is continually calculating every single one of these possible solutions to provide statistically the best solution available and that solution which would just happen to be this guy for example is what the what the um, what the solution is going to lock on to and then initialize or give you your answer to so with precision based surveying the reported pre precisions give a statistical measure of the quality of a position solution so you need to understand that pre precisions are normally given at a particular confidence level. So an example with a float fix solution would be, let's say, a 68% um, CEP type solution versus HDGNSS, which gives us a 95% confidence level. So reported horizontal and vertical precisions are a function of the satellite geometry, so with HDGNSS, the more satellites that we have, the more um, calculations and redundancy in our information we have, which will improve our precision. It also takes into account measurement errors, primarily multipath. So smaller multipath or less multipath or measurement errors will improve our precision. And with this type of technology, the term initialize is now redefined. Initialize previously was when we went from float to fixed. Now initialized with HDGNSS just means that the RTK has been started and your precision values are dependent upon the environment. So previously, as an example, with float fixed, we have a set of precision values that are being reported on the screen at a, uh, using the CEP, circular error of probability type of calculation. We have a horizontal and vertical precision value but we also have listed on the bottom of the screen as an RMS value. And one of the big misconceptions is, is that horizontal and vertical precision value that we're seeing on the screen isn't the actual physical horizontal and vertical precision. We also have to take into account that RMS value and other um, biases that can be introduced into the solution. The difference is with HDGNSS, all of the RMS, satellite geometry, and things like that, all, of, all the possible biases that we see um, that are our tendencies in the background when surveying are all calculated into that solution. So what we have is when we see the horizontal and vertical precision values on the bottom of the screen, we're getting a 95% confidence level um, representation of what those values are. So make a long story short, the precision values you see on the bottom of the screen are the actual precision values that you are getting. So HDGNSS delivers a seamless convergence to the same traditional fixed position that uh, fixed precision levels I should say that we're seeing but a lot faster. So you can see down here on the graph we have our float solution diverging, fixing and then rolling with it over time but we can also have the incorrectly fixed solution. That's what we looked at earlier. With HDGNSS, it locks in much faster down to a fixed solution, and then our, um, our precision values are reported as such. So an important aspect of the scheme is it delivers corresponding converging precisions, and the polarized switch from float to fix is gone. So you turn on, you turn on HDGNSS, it locks onto the satellites and it's instantly fixed. And then at that point, all you're looking at is the, um, the horizontal and vertical precision values that are being read out to you on the data collector. And typically, an environment that would cause a bad initialization with float fixed or would um, take you from fixed mode out into float mode and pretty much cause you to not be able to survey at that point is now still going to stay fixed. It's just going to report higher precision values. So an example would be if you're going to walk into the trees with a float fixed type solution, RMS is going to go up, PDOP is going to go up, and initialization is going to be lost, and you're going to have to try to figure out how to get that measurement. With HDGNSS, you can walk right into the trees. You will still stay fixed. Your precisions will obviously go up because it's not as GPS friendly, but you can be confident that the points you're measuring and the precision values that you're seeing on the screen are what you're actually getting in the field. So here's just a quick little example, um, a positioning advantage example, as it's called. You can see the blue line it would be our float solution. And you can see over time, it'll eventually uh, kind of converge and, and tighten up. 
and the black line is the HDGNSS solution. So you can see how it locks in and tightens up much faster than what we're traditionally uh, used to seeing. And there's a 44 second period in here right off the start where the HDGNSS solution produced where conventional fixed solution would have failed. And this is just kind of a, a blown up view of it. So a little summary. HDGNSS throws away the traditional float fixed. It now just gives us strictly pre uh, precision based measurements, which allows us to start measuring sooner. Also shorter occupation times. It's a much more robust calculation. And it allows us to measure with confidence in challenging environments. Like I said earlier, you can see down in the bottom here with the previous RTK fixed, you can see we have a horizontal and vertical precision value, which isn't necessarily the exact values we're getting because we need to take into account RMS and other things like that, which aren't calculated into this solution. HDGNSS produces a horizontal and a vertical precision value where the RMS and PDOP and everything else is calculated into here. And this is at a 95% level. So again, like I said earlier, what you see is what you get. So that's kind of the, the real quick basics of HD GNSS technology. There's a couple of other new things that uh, are built into the R10 that I want to cover. The first one is the XFIL technology. So when we're surveying in the field, there are times when the reference um, corrections from our base station can be blocked, whether it's rough terrain, things like that. Rover positioning normally ceases soon after the interruption, meaning you, you lose radio, you're going to go into float mode, and you're not going to be able to continue. Uh, the Trimble RTX technology delivers precise GNSS orbit and clock data to users via a satellite correction. An XFIL helps to maintain precise rover positioning while normal GNSS corrections are blocked. So essentially XFIL is going to fill in the gap when you lose your correction stream from your base. This is the uh, current RTX network. So it's a Trimble owned network. They have uh, base stations all over the world, uh, right around 100 stations currently. Um, GNSS data from each of the tracking stations are networked and processed at a central control center or a central server and produces centimeter level satellite orbit and clock corrections. That information from the RTX control center is then uploaded to four um, geostationary L-band satellites, which also, um, again, like I said, kind of, kind of feeds the receiver if we lose our correction from VRS or from our physical reference station. So these are uh, just a listing of the four um, L-band satellites. So looking at some differencing errors here, the usual method when a primary stream is available, the errors are common to the single base and the rover cancel. So as we said in one of the previous slides, we keep our uh, base station and our rover, or keep our baseline shorter. That error is generally very similar between the base and the rover because they're so close together and those positions cancel out. Or the VRS stream errors are similar to the rover using interpolation based on the network-wide um, atmospheric and ionospheric um, um, errors. So at the rover we have some um, integer biases, atmospheric errors, satellite clock errors, satellite orbital errors. The GNSS errors are at the reference station or in VRS. We also have biases, atmospheric errors, satellite clock errors, and satellite orbit errors. And for the most part those errors cancel each other out and the residual errors left over are what we see in our values at the rover. Using RTX, um, we, we end up with kind of a similar solution, but the process is a little different. First, the rover has to operate autonomously. So XFIL will not kick in until the correction stream is lost at the rover. The RTX service provides the satellite clock and orbital errors and the model errors are removed at the rover, and then the local atmospheric effects are then estimated. So again, at the rover we have our biases, 
atmospheric errors, satellite clock, and satellite orbit errors. We have GNSS errors that are modeled in the RTX stream. So we have our integer biases, our clock, and our orbital errors. And then we also have GNSS atmospheric algorithms that are produced by the RTX service, which then give us residual errors left over for our precisions at our rover. So a quick example when the primary stream is blocked. We have a radio or cellular modem signal is unavailable. So here we have a single uh, physical reference station. We are running here. We're working just fine. We get behind the buildings and we have our positional outage. So typically we would be, uh, be kind of dead in the water at that point. We get to a place where it picks it back up and we can keep going. Now using RTX and the L-band stream, once we have that outage, the rover generates autonomous positions, XFIL kicks in seamlessly, and the RTX L-band satellite then provides the correction stream for the area where we don't have the service so we can continue to get our data. So some considerations in the field. XFIL will start seamlessly without convergence. Um, effect of the loss of the LT or the L-band RTX stream so if you lose the RTX stream, XFIL will continue for 20 seconds, and it will resume without delay for up to five minutes. So if you lose your uh, radio or your VRS correction stream and XFIL kicks in, you can essentially survey with high-level accuracy for up to five minutes. So the loss and gain, um, effect, effect of loss and gain of satellites, loss and gain is okay if you maintain four satellites. But if you drop to three satellites, um, it, the, the system is going to require a radio link in order to restart. And the precisions are affected by the satellite geometry, or what you might hear um, um, on the data collector is PDOP. So it's important that RTK or VRS reference coordinates are accurate with respect of the ITRF. Errors in ITRF reference or rover coordinates propagate into drift in the XFIL position. And the XFIL duration is dependent upon the precision settings. So again, we have a five-minute timeout in current uh, firmware version. So again, XFIL kicks in. It's, gonna, it's basically going to uh, allow you to keep going for five minutes. That position is actually going to diverge over time. So the farther you get into the five minutes, your precision values will grow. The nice part about it is, is all you need is a single data packet. So what I mean by that is if you're in VRS uh, or you're surveying with VRS and your cellular service is going in and out, it goes out, XFIL kicks in, you get one spot where you get one little data packet from the VRS network, that five minutes will reset. So XFIL is a huge advantage at that point. Here's a quick uh, XFIL positioning example. You can see this is our VRS solution. This is in centimeters, so we're less than a half a centimeter here. After five minutes, uh, VRS is lost. XFIL kicks in. Still relatively accurate for the first minute, and you can see how it diverges over time over the five minutes, but it still stays within about two and a half centimeters. Here's just another example vertically. All right, so that is XFIL. The, other, uh, the, the next thing I want to talk about is SurePoint. So SurePoint is built into the R10. It's an integrated tilt sensor. So with SurePoint, we have this thing called the E-bubble, um, which you can see right here. This is your electronic bubble based on the internal tilt sensor within the R10 receiver. So the E-bubble means that all the measurement information is going to be on the same place meaning all you have to do now is look at the screen to level up. You don't have to look back and forth at the, uh, the rod bubble. Uh, guards against erroneous measurements due to pole tilt. Um, I would say the, uh, the rover pole level bubble is one of those things that often gets overlooked and, the, um, and calibrated. It allows you to measure faster with automatic point measurement and storage, so you can set it to automatically measure once the uh, receiver is leveled up and it'll store and you can keep going. So pretty much you can measure without pushing any buttons. And it also, uh, the tilt information gets written to the raw data so it gives you another level of traceability in your survey data. 
So the e-bubble can be used instead of the traditional pull bubble. Um, on the data collector, you can press Control-L to either show or hide the e-bubble from any screen. The e-bubble, this is important, is aligned to the front side LED panel of the R10. That is this guy right here. You need to make sure that when you're using this and using the e-bubble that the system is um, facing this way, that basically you're facing the keypad in order for the, uh, the, the level bubble on the screen of your data collector to move the same direction as what you're seeing with the R10. And then it does need to be calibrated every once in a while. So this can be done right in Trimble Access under Receiver Settings. Set the R10 up on a tripod with a, with a recently calibrated uh, tribrac, and then the process is all automated. So as we said earlier, it's going to guard against erroneous measurements due to pole tilt. If it goes outside of your uh, predefined tilt tolerances, a tilt warning will appear um, if it's outside of that. And um, it will also, with the newer uh, versions of Access, if it goes outside of your tilt tolerance while measure, it will actually auto-abandon the measure, uh, the measurement so you don't store bad data. This all can also be, uh, be disabled if needed. So the auto-measure and auto-store, um, you can survey hundreds of points with only one tap of the Start button. The measurement will automatically begin when the tilt is within a predefined tolerance and then auto stored after two epics, um, two epics of data. And you can also adjust the, um, the tilt um, tolerances. You can see here are just some examples. You can set the, uh, the level bubble up to either tighten or loosen uh, your tilt tolerances. Again, like I said, it gives you a new level of traceability. So a lot of surveyors want to see raw data. The tilt sensor values are stored with every point and can be reviewed in TBC or Access. You can see right here this one is um, quite a large outlier. It's got about 8 centimeters of tilt. Um, moving on, I want to now talk a little bit about the current uh, GNSS constellation status, kind of where we're at and where... Um, Trimble kind of sees things going to give you a little uh, glimpse into the future here. So currently with uh, GPS, which is a United States-based system, we've got uh, 31 satellites. 28 of them are L1 and L2, and two of them have L1, L2, and L5. And they're hoping by um, 2017, which is not that far away, to have triple frequency satellites fully available to uh, to users and by 2020 they want to launch what they call GPS 3. GLONASS has uh, 24 satellites we also have this QZSS which is Japan um, that's kind of starting to get off the ground they've got one satellite Galileo is up to six and this Beidou this Chinese uh, constellation um, is up to 15 satellites um, you can see Galileo expects to have a full constellation of 30 satellites by 2020, and Beidou is hoping to have 35 satellites by 2020 as well, which would make this then a global coverage. Right now it's kind of um, it's regional based over the, the Chinese region. So why is that important to us? Well, with the R10, it's going to provide full constellation support. So we're likely to see 90 GNSS satellites in orbit by 2015 and estimated that there could be more than 120 satellites in orbit by 2020. The R10 with the Trimble 360 technology um, supports signals from all of those satellite constellations that we just listed with 440 tracking channels, meaning that it is what we call future-proof to handle anything that we're likely to see in the future. So Trimble 360, um, additional satellites and signals will enhance the performance of RTK. It will give us um, more precise code measurements. Uh, we're hoping, and, and I'm pretty excited to see the, uh, the growth of triple, triple frequency GNSS, which is only going to improve our convergence times, extend the range of operation from a single reference station, which means we're going to be able to venture farther and farther and farther away from our base stations without having to worry about um, introducing more air into our survey. And it's also going to improve, um, improve our accuracy 
with triple frequency GNSS and this precision-based calculations, um, we're hoping that we can get to a point where we can pretty much reduce multipath to a point where it's not even an issue. So a quick little summary. The R10 system is basically the culmination of over 30 years of, of product technology um, developments at Trimble. It sets a new industry benchmark for RTK technology and performance. The Exfil service will seamlessly bridge correction stream dropouts, whether it's radio or through uh, GPRS or, or VRS modem. And the R10 hardware fully supports all emerging constellations and uh, with the new version of HD GNSS engine available via firmware support. Okay, at this time, I would like to uh, try to open this up to questions here.